Ambassador Dato Dr. G. K. Ananda Kumarasiri is a career ambassador of over 30 years standing. He retired in 1995 as Director General ASEAN. Since then, he has authored several notable books on such important subjects such as The Cultivation of Human Values, Personal Development, Holistic Education, The Sacredness of Motherhood, Mother Care, Holistic Parenting, Child Care and Development, and Peace. He is a much sought after Dharma speaker in Malaysia and overseas. His recent treatise on holistic motherhood and parenting is widely used as a practical yet effective training manual for courses on social ills and crimes, such as drug abuse, AIDS, child abuse and gender inequality. He is the president of the Human Development and Peace Foundation. Dr. G. K. Ananda Kumarasiri has carved a niche for himself in espousing the concept of living by Buddhism by emphasizing the practice and practical application of the Buddha's teachings in daily life. He is available for public talks and discussions. His email is akumarasiri at yahoo.com. You may also refer to www.livingbybuddhism.com for an insight into his works and activities. Suke Hoto. So while welcoming you to this program, I would like to read out something uttered by a very prominent character who is none other than Dato Dr. Anand Kumarasiri. Education is one of the most used but most abused words in English language today. If you ask 10 people what the meaning and the purpose of education is, one would get 10 different answers. So, while welcoming you to this knowledge discussion of ours, I would like to introduce you to Dato Dr. Anand Kumarasiri. Now, he was the former ambassador of Malaysia as well as the former director general of the Asian organization. So, we warmly welcome you to this program. And also, sir, I would like you to explain of what I uttered, uh, the phrases I uttered just before uh, welcoming you. Suki Hotu Suani. Um, I am delighted that you have greeted me, Suki Hotu. You have caught on very fast. Oh, thank uh, you. You are a quick learner. And uh, for the benefit of the viewers, this mm -hmm. is a greeting which is uh, born out of uh, Metta, Karuna, Mudita, and Upeka. And it means, may you be happy and well mm -hmm. always. It has been in the Buddhist culture, but it's been somehow or other lost in the, over time. And we need to revive this and make it a universal greeting. Mm -hmm. Now, you had cited or quoted uh, a statement I made, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually a very serious statement. I mean, to say uh, that, you know, education, the term education is a uh, most abused word. We need to understand education to start with to why I have used, have used, taken that particular position or premise. Education means to draw. This is from, you know, from the Latin word to educate, to, is to draw out what, whatever there is within. And today people are using the word education and using you know, education uh, as a uh, way to achieve something else completely beyond what it actually means. Uh, for example, if you ask some policy makers at a very high level, even governmental level, many governments, they say, we want to educate the people so that they will become better employed. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you have a policy statement to say your whole education policy trust is to make people better employed, you have lost sight of the meaning of education. Mm -hmm. uh, then they say, you know, we want to have more knowledge workers. This is uh, uh, a reference that many of the leaders today say, you know, we want to have more knowledge workers, therefore we must have more computer and, you know, more uh, computer savvy kind of programs and, and all kinds of things take place. But m the reason why I, I say, you know, that it has been abused is because of policy statement and also the way it has been approached. As far as I'm concerned, I firmly believe that the education systems, not just in Sri Lanka, but you know, in many parts of the world, has failed. Mm 
The education system has failed. The reason why I say it has failed is because, you know, there are more children having opportunity to go to school today than there was even a generation ago. More children have chances to go to school. There are better facilities and there are better technological developments, infrastructure facilities, uh, closer proximity to their home, all kinds of developments that have taken place which makes education more easily available. Mm -hmm. But there are more people who are committing mm -hmm. crimes and social ills than ever before, unprecedented. Not only are the numbers of people who are committing social ills and crimes who are um, guilty of deviant behavior mm -hmm. um, higher in terms of numbers, but the age has lowered so much that even a 10-year-old can, you know, uh, be a murderer today. Um, there are so many cases of, you mm -hmm. know, 10-year-olds mm -hmm. being murderers, being, you know, drug addicts and doing all kinds of things which are unheard of just a generation ago. So it brings us to ponder and ask the serious question, how come if education is supposed to make you a better person and if this is happening so rampantly in all, over, all across society, then obviously something is wrong somewhere. That's why I say education has failed. And when many of these policy makers and you know, leaders tend to try and address this problem, they tend to fall into the same you know, a trap of looking at the symptoms of the problem. This is a human frailty. Whenever you have a major problem and you want to find out what actually is the solution to the problem, people tend to look at the symptoms. They don't look at the root of the problem. Secondly, they tend to think of the problem as something distant, something far away, not near to you, not within you. So they look outside. They don't look inside. And this is what we are able to, um, you know, differ from the normal mm -hmm. tendency because the Buddha had very clearly given us the Four Noble Truths. Although we tend to be taught that the Four Nobles is, is about Dukkha, the rising of Dukkha and the elimination of Dukkha and the way to eliminate Dukkha, it is a formula. Mm -hmm. It is a formula. It's a framework for any problem. Any problem can be solved and addressed if you follow the Four Noble Truths in terms of the methodology. But we don't apply that methodology when it comes to education and for that matter for most other problems. And therefore we are not able to overcome the problem of education. Now the problem of education is, be is, is largely because they have not understood what education is all about. Education should be geared to bring about the development of the human being. And what is the human being? Even the term human being is not understood. In our language, for example, we refer to the human being as manusya. manusya. Or manusya or manusya. And we, we are using this term very loosely without realizing why we use it. The reason why we, we refer to ourselves as manusya is because we have a mana or we have a mano. We have a mind. And the Buddha pointed out this mind can be developed, can be trained, can be cultured. It is because of our mind and because we are able to think and rationalize and behave according to our thinking that we are not animals. Actually, mm -hmm. technically we are animals, but because we, are have, we have the mind, we are referred to as human beings. And when we are referred to as human beings, it's actually being human. The underlying word is being. That is how we get the word human being. being. But are we being human? <laughs> we are not being human. So the minute if you are not being human, you are no worse than an animal. Tirisan. So we need to now grapple with this concept. The fact that we are human beings, but we are not being trained, being taught to be human beings. The other aspect of this important point is that 
education does not start in school. This is a very, very fundamental point the Buddha had, had uh, underlined and we fail to understand this. We fail to recognize this and we have overlooked it completely. And as we go along in this so-called modern age, we have in fact, you know, gone overboard on this. The cultivation of the mind should be the main focus of education, which mm -hmm. is not. Now this mind develops in the mother's womb. From mm -hmm. the day the time of conception takes place, mm -hmm. this mind is already working. That also we have not. And when the child is born, this mind is all the time developing and you know acquiring knowledge, information and mm -hmm. all kinds of influence. What happens today is that the child is born and this mind is getting negative influences. And the parents are not looking after the child in terms of child care and child development. The Buddha underscored that the parents are the foremost, first and foremost teachers. And he referred to the parents as Pubba Acharya. Mm -hmm. Now because we don't have this approach of looking at the development of the mind from early childhood, we are unable to bring about the right mental culture when the child goes to school. By the time the child goes to school, it's already late because all the negative influences have come out. And in the schools, the methodology also is wrong. That is the other problem that we have. Not only is the lack of understanding of the fact that we need to look at the mind and develop this mind even before the child goes to school, mm -hmm. and the how should be the first school. Now, how many, children, how many parents are able to provide this? How many parents are providing this? Sure. They are just leaving the children either in front of the TV or with some ayah or some maid, or, and, and the maid is taking the precedence. And they're not giving quality time for their child. And the child is having all kinds of influences which are not holistic, which are not wholesome. And this you cannot erase from the mind. It is there. It becomes very much part of the thinking process of this child. And the only way this can be changed is to deprogram the mind. We need to deprogram the mind before we can bring in an and culture the mm -hmm. mind with what we want. Okay. So we talked about a culturalization, a wrong kind of a culturalization takes place. Mm -hmm. Now we need to deculturalize this mind and then put and culturalize it with whatever we are talking about mm -hmm. today. So hopefully, you know, if we can get parents and policymakers to understand that the root of the problem is not so much you know, in terms of some of the facilities and various other things that they think is a problem. Mm -hmm. But to develop an understanding among young parents particularly, before even they get married, that when they have children, they have to give their time and attention to develop the child's mind in a wholesome, holistic way at home, long before the child goes to school. In the school system, mm -hmm. we need to have sufficient inputs in developing this mind. Today, there's nothing, there's nothing being done in the education system mm -hmm. to develop this mind. Mm -hmm. What is happening in the education system is that they are completely loading mm -hmm. the child with cognitive knowledge. There are three levels of learning. The first level is called cognitive learning, which is actually, you know, cognition, based on cognition. That is, you can recognize a thing and you understand that that's a thing. For example, this is a book, mm -hmm. is a table, this is a mm -hmm. chair, and, you know, that, that's, that's what it is. And it is basically knowledge, facts, information. And that's the lowest level of learning. It's just pure knowledge. Mm -hmm. And in the computer world that we have, if you want knowledge, you just click the button you can get. Yet we are pa putting children through the whole education system of katapadang and you know, knowledge base and learning knowledge. There is another level of, edu of learning called affective learning. Mm -hmm. Affective learning is where you develop your aesthetics. 
your feelings, your emotions, your analysis, your synthesis, your ability to think out of the box, originality, creativity, um, your appreciation uh, and your way of expressing artistically, musically, all those things come out at the effective level of learning. And the third level of learning is go even higher and that is called psychomotor level of learning. Mm -hmm. Psychomotor level of learning is, is, is where psycho means your mind and motor means your action is immersed in the learning. Mm -hmm. So you not only know, but you become what you know. You begin to internalize whatever you learn and then you are the learning itself. There are many people who know a lot of things. You know, they know that drugs is bad. You ask any drug addict, you ask any smoker, they know smoking is bad. It's not that they do not know smoking is bad. It's just that the mind has not been cultured in such a way that it says, no, I'm not going to take this. So we need to internalize mm -hmm. all these aspects of holistic development. Mm -hmm. We need to bring back education to what it is supposed to be, to develop the human being rather than, you know, see how he can get a certificate, how he can get a qualification, how he can get a job, how he can get straight A's. That has been the focus. I mean, I'm sure if, I, if, if you look back, you know, into what has been happening over the years in, in, in Sri Lanka, for mm -hmm. example, which is a very classic case. I don't say this is happening only in Sri Lanka, but Sri Lanka is a very classic case. Let me ask you, I turn back the question, what do you think is happening in terms of the education system in Sri Lanka? Well, then again, as you said, I think uh, mostly they are, I think education is for employment. That's yeah. what the younger generation thinks. So I'm think. not wrong, yes. Yeah, you're definitely not wrong. Mm. And also, I remember as a child when I went to Sunday school, uh, the most venerable Madhye uh, Mahanayakatero used to say, he went and did an interview in the jail. And he found out that most uh, prisoners have not gone not only to Sunday school, but school. also uh, to school or just uh, maybe turned out of school uh, rather young. But uh, then, uh, Dr. Kumarasuri, I noticed that, well, within the educated society also, or what we call educated, now we come across doctors who commit crime or lawyers who commit crime. So as you said, I think not only in Sri Lanka, I think around the world, mostly the education system have, uh, has uh, failed, mm -hmm. as you said. Yeah. But in Sri Lanka, I noticed one additional um, 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 feature. Mm -hmm. And that feature is this tuition. You know? Exactly. You have mm -hmm. schools and you have a parallel system going mm -hmm. on, tuition. Mm -hmm. And that's because, you know, society parents, teachers, policy makers, you know, condone it or whatever, I do not know. And it has already been existing for some time. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you say that you need a tuition system, you know, as a parallel system of education, that means obviously what is happening in school is a flop. It's a failure. Definitely. <laughs> it, it, is, it is already a self-admission, but it is going on. And it is, you know, what you call it, booming booming business, you know, tuition classes, and that is not education, where a child just memorizes, you know, they just memorize, they just memorize the whole thing and go to the examination halls and <coughs> it's great. Mm -hmm. That is not education at all. So this is another feature that we find in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. And we need to ask ourselves now, are we going to continue like this? What is going to happen if we continue like this? Obviously, we are going to get the, the problems, you know, of not being able to achieve development, not being able to achieve a harmonious society, and all the other, you know, negative elements are going to be, you know, uh, more prominent. So, we need to now work very closely with policy makers as well as practitioners to see how we can solve this problem. Or in my own little way, um, I am not an educationist by any any chance. You know, I happen to be interested in it. Mm -hmm. I happen to be uh, asked to set up a training institute 
to train ambassadors for the Malaysian government, mm. diplomats. And as a result of my involvement in setting up this institute, I came to know about training and education, education psychology, learning psychology. And here, I was able to reflect and see, not only in Malaysia, but many other countries like Sri Lanka as well, that, you know, we are so, um, you know, uh, sad situation mm -hmm. where you have a history of Buddhist education and Buddhist pedagogy, yet we are not using it. Uh, I, I know for centuries, you know, there has been great educators because of the Buddhist heritage and the Buddha himself, you know, is an unparalleled teacher, unsurpassed teacher, um, peerless teacher. In fact, after we say our five precepts, um, we salute and we honor the Buddha by stating that, you know, um, he is unparalleled teacher, Purusa Dhamma Sarati Satta Deva Manusana, not only a, just an honor to teacher yeah. of gods God. and men, mm -hmm. but do we know how he taught? Are we using the methods he taught? Definitely not. not. So this is a paradox. Here you have a heritage of Buddhist education, a rich Buddhist education, and you also have a pedagogy. I can't use any other words. Pedagogy actually means teaching methods and techniques. He used some fantastic methods. I mean, uh, he taught every strata of society. He taught murderers, serial killers, Angulimala. He taught Kisagotami through simulation, through role play, um, through interactive learning, all kinds of modern jargon that you come across today. They use all kinds of jargon in modern education. Um, you know, uh, t the terms are there. But actually the Buddha had already used this. And he is also, as I mentioned earlier, I talked about cognitive, affective and psychomotor. Mm -hmm. And when I came across these terms, I thought, well, you know, it's some big discovery. But fortunately, you know, when I look back, I, w I was able to trace that, you know, the Buddha had talked about Pariyati, Patipati, and Pativeda. He had already explained that, you know, the base the, of all learning is just basic knowledge. That's the base. Mm -hmm. Pure knowledge, the theory. But you need to go beyond theory. You need to go into understanding. He even went one step further. You've got to understand what it is all about. That's why in the Eightfold Path you have right understanding. Mm -hmm. It goes right down through the all, the all the Eightfold Paths. If you don't have understanding of the knowledge, then the knowledge doesn't make sense. It's just like any other knowledge. It's neutral. So he emphasized right understanding. Mm -hmm. And he also emphasized the importance of internalizing. You need to internalize. You, you, it's no point knowing something, but if you do not make it part of your life. So that's why he had Pariyati, mm -hmm. where you internalize. This internalization process is all the time there. Even when we say five precepts, for example, we say Sikha Padang Samadhyami. The term Sikha Pada is skillful training in the practice of not killing of not injuring. That skillful training is underlined in all of the five precepts. It is a training program. Buddhism is a complete mm -hmm. training program for us to develop ourselves. So if we are able to now focus on Buddhist education and Buddhist pe pedagogy, then there is a chance to change the education system. More and more of this should go into the education system so that there should be a curricula for the development of the human being and understanding, uh, self-understanding of what we are as human beings. Mm -hmm. If we are able to understand our human condition and what it is to be human, then we have a chance to move in the right direction. Otherwise, we'll be just using education as a passport to a job or to getting a certificate um, and earning, you know, something which is not what it is supposed to be. 
Um, then he went to Pativeda, mm -hmm. which is not only knowing, but you know, being what you know and then having the wisdom from it. Um, based on that, you might be asking, you know, um, as to how we can bring about these things yes. in actual life. Now, I'll ask, I'll ask you another question. When you went to school, um, you, you obviously must have learned your ABC. You know, you speak so good English. So, um, you must have gone to an English school somehow or other. Um, how did you learn your ABC, for example? What did you well, how much was uh, I didn't go to uh, an English school. I went to Visakha Vidyalaya. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. And uh, I think I learned it from home. My mother taught it. A is for? Apple. apple That's what okay. we all say. Yeah. And B is for bat. Yeah. C is for cat. Yeah. Have you seen an apple tree? Well, no. no. Then why do you learn here for apple? You have not seen an apple tree. And you know, this has been going on for hundreds of years. In the early days when they taught A is for apple, the child even didn't even see an apple. You know, he was exactly. taught A is for apple. And here is cognitive learning. You know, I'm illustrating cognitive learning as it, mm -hmm. as it has been done from, from small. So I thought, you know, this, is, this doesn't make sense. And I thought, you know, we will try and bring out Buddhist education mm -hmm. and Buddhist pedagogy into this process. And, and I thought, you know, just talking about it at the conceptual level, you can talk and talk and talk, you know, but what you do, nothing happens. So I realized very early that we need to provide tools. We need to provide actual tools mm -hmm. to bring about the conceptual aspects we discussed earlier on. And, there, and, and I produced this book, um, this, book. Uh, this My Alphabet Book. This book, um, My Alphabet Book, Buddhist Pedagogical Approach, was intentionally brought as a tool, as an illustration, mm -hmm. uh, to put into practice what I had talked in terms of the concepts of learning and teaching. And instead of learning A for apple, in this lesson, I teach A for altar. Mm -hmm. And I am not just teaching, I'm only just, you know, creating an atmosphere of learning. The unfortunate part today is that the teacher has become a teacher in the, in, in the actual sense of the word, whereas he or she should only be a facilitator. The children exactly. should be learning much to by themselves. And the best way to bring about this, the best way to realize is by interactive learning. Mm -hmm. If the children are interacting, talking, asking questions, then they are alive, then they are thinking, then they are learning. But if you just tell them this is it and repeat what it is, it is like teaching a parrot. It's like, exactly. you know, katapala. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just teach and uh, they're just learning uh, on a route, route learning basis. Mm -hmm. And that is not learning. This lesson A for Alter, I can manage it. I can run this for hours and hours throughout the year, in fact. I will ask the children, do you have an altar? Do you know what is an altar? And mm -hmm. some children will be so excited. They'll be so excited they want to talk about the altar they have in the house. Okay. I am not teaching. They are talking. They'll be so proud describing mm. the altar, what they do, how they do. And that's wonderful. They are exactly. alive. Then the child who has no altar will say, Teacher, I don't know what an altar oh. is. You know, by the time the mm -hmm. class is finished and they go home, that child who has no altar will tell the Tata and Ami or the father and mother that she wants an altar. Automatically. Okay. So I've taken the lesson from the school, from the classroom mm -hmm. to the home. Then I ask a number of things, you know, what do you find in the altar, they talk, they describe. I can have a simulation program, I can create an altar in the classroom, mm -hmm. make them bring some things and have a puja. They are alive, this is simulation, this is role play, they are active mm -hmm. learning. This is experiential learning which the Buddha taught. The Buddha said, experience, find out, investigate, you know, and we can't do this unless we bring about this form of learning, exactly. this approach of mm -hmm. learning. 
Well, uh, I think uh, we do this type of lesson at this uh, the Hampasala yes. or the, sun, uh, yeah. the Saturday school yeah. rather yeah. at the Sambodhi Vihara and uh, most uh, kindly uh, doctor has taken over a class, yes. I suppose. I did once. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I, 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 I had proven, I mm -hmm. had proven. In fact, I asked the children uh, to draw their altar. The next Saturday, mm -hmm. children brought so proudly, I said, I want to pin up your altars, you know. They brought up the altar so proudly and they started showing very proudly the altar in the house. Mm -hmm. They also said that they helped the parents to pluck the flowers for the puja in the house. Mm -hmm. Then there's also the other aspects, you know, of why they offer flowers. They learn. As I said, you know, the mechanical side is now what is in vogue. But here the child now knows why I offer flowers. What is the significance? The child learns deep Dhamma from this. Sorry. I have taught mm -hmm. them that if the flower is beautiful and, you know, bright, but has no fragrance, no insects will come and pollinate it. Nobody wants to come. None of the insects. But even if it's not beautiful, but if it has got fragrance mm -hmm. uh, and it, it is able to, you know, have that fragrance, mm -hmm. insects will still come. Similarly, similarly, children, you might be the most beautiful, you might be the most handsome, you might be the richest, the cleverest in the class, but if you don't have virtues, if you're mm -hmm. not kind, if you're not... Uh, well-mannered, mm -hmm. good behavior, they will not, nobody will want to come mm -hmm. close to you. And so, they are able to understand this. And of course, I give the history of offering of flowers. It's a cultural history. Whenever, you know, a respected person that has been the tradition to express our appreciation mm -hmm. and joy and honor of that person seeking refuge, all those things. We can go on and on and on teaching the Dhamma in English. And at the same time, they learn the vocabulary, they learn the alphabets, they learn the language. It's much better than, than learning A for apple. And I go on and on. In fact, I say C is for cat. Mm -hmm. It's the normal way that yeah. you learn. But here, I'm able to teach C is for caring. C is for caring. How do you care for your mother? How do you care for your grandfather? How do you care for your, for your father? Uh, and how you care for your grandmother. And the child is able then to go home and practice and come back to class and say, I did this, I did that, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. This is fun. Yeah. You know, we should make learning fun. Whereas we are making learning such a torturous thing. You know, you, you, at, at, even at, at the age of the child, I know children are going to tuition class at the age of five and six. In so Singapore, they, they are competing with each other just to, you know, be first in the class, which is a crime because the child is growing at this age. The child needs to experience, to feel, to, to grow up in the normal, natural process. But we are just turning them out to be something else. And some of them just get burnt out. They fall out of the education system. They just give up. It's too much. Some commit suicide, you know. And... Um, the other point I need to point out is that our value systems have to change. We tend to mm -hmm. value these straight A's as the all and be all of, you know, a child's life and education. Parents and policy makers make it to be so and we honor and we, you know, glorify these people. But if you take the this, 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 this number of students like a pyramid, it's only one or point point five or what small mm -hmm. percentage of people students are involving the top A's. What about the rest? You mean they are useless? If this is how we are going to you know, look at them, we are asking for trouble. In fact, a nation is built by the people who are below. The bulk of the people are exactly. middle and below. Mm -hmm. So they have to be more productive. They have to be more you know, energetic, more alert, more resourceful. We need to motivate them. The achievers will automatically go on their own, whether the teacher, you know, praises them or not, they'll be doing well. But we need to now make the others feel that they are also benefiting, they are also learning, and they are also important and valuable 
people of the country, citizens of the country. Yes, well, sir, I would like to ask you now, you just happened to mention some children, they just fall out of the, they just get burned out from the education system because it's far too much for them. But the parents, they think because now even for us, we had to go for tuition because the others are doing it. And like we had the fear, we'll fall out if we don't. Sometimes it's not that the school teacher is bad. She does a pretty good job. But since the fact that the others are doing it and the fear of losing the race, mm -hmm. I think that's what sort of motivates them and the parents to do this. So what sort of advice can you give the parents? Because sometimes they realize that it's too much for their children. Not every child can cope up with it. What sort of advice can you give the um, parents? Two or three things. First of all, they need to understand um, that, you know, as parents, they must have unconditional love. They must have unconditional love for their child. They, they shouldn't love their child because, you know, she's smart or he's smart or he's excelling, ex excelling in class and, you know, excellent student. And they should not degrade the child because not doing so well in school and things like that. That, that, that has to be there. And that again we need to acculturalize. This has not been acculturalized. I mean nobody, nobody teaches anybody to be a parent to start exactly. with. We'll mm -hmm. be discussing this later. But right now since you brought up the point, we are not trained to do that. And we need to do it you know, in, 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 in a way that uh, children, even before people get married they should know these are the things, mm -hmm. you know, not to do these kind of things. And society as a whole should change through policy changes. The policy decision makers must institute policies and value systems which do not reinforce what you are talking about. As it is, they are reinforcing. We need to turn it around, diffuse the situation by saying, well, no, straight A's is not everything. And you know, if you're a rounded person, reward that rounded student. If that person has, the student has got extracurricular excellence, reward that. So the policy, again, must come into play. If you're rewarding somebody because, you know, he or she excels as being a good leader in class or, you know, having certain qualities, uh, certain other talents and skills, reward that. And uh, the system, of course, also has to change it should move from exam orientation because the whole thing is because exam has become uh, you know the, 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 the what you call it the most sacred thing <laughs> in the education system so you need to now remove that exam emphasis or exam orientation and paper qualification orientation that your system of education itself must be oriented towards group tasks exercises, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, research, mm -hmm. uh, projects, um, problem solving. When you learn in a, in a parrot form, in a route learning form, you are only thinking in that same groove. You cannot think outside of that groove. In fact, you know, I, I give a very classical, classic case. Um, the teachers teach mangoes are sour. You know, and the child is forced to learn mangoes <laughs> are sour. But if a child is so used to tasting sweet mangoes, can you expect the child to say this? Child? No. Definitely so not. So we need to encourage, you know, mm -hmm. this kind of lateral thinking, thinking out of the box, creative thinking, originality. Again, as I said, you know, this is very much in Buddhist pedagogy. The Pariyati Patipati Pativeda system of education provides you all the opportunity to be creative, to think out of the box. And also the Buddhist concept of, you know, of Kalyana Mitra, of working together, of Samagga, all these things should be inculcated in the social culturalization, social education. Mm -hmm. Not only in the home, but when they come to school, all this must be ingrained. I mm -hmm. mean, Part of the education is, you know, the socialization of, mm -hmm. of, of, of the child. If the child is not able to ingrain all these things, then obviously the child is not going to grow up to be having these values in, in, in the mind and in the, in the behavior. Mm -hmm. No chance. Because you have not encouraged these things. 
when you have a group exercise, whereas the Western and the so-called modern one, the individual is more important, be individualistic, I first, my, mine, you know, those things have now to be taken off our system. It is foreign to Buddhist culture. It is foreign to Buddhist culture and it is foreign to the Buddhist education system. But the exercises that we, the role play, if you have a puja together, if you develop this concept of Kalyanamitra in the classroom and children grow up, the parents know the children, the children know the parents, there is no need to compete and, you know, um, take some special pride that your child is the first. By all means, if the first, well, well and good. But don't make it a huge song and dance, you know. <laughs> uh, it should not be the case. The other child might be, you know, good in something else. So the... The curriculum must change, the books must change, the methodology must change, and the emphasis then, of course, will take a different course. And hopefully, over some years, we will be able to downplay this paper qualification. We can have interviews, we can have, you know, recommendations from the teacher that I can vouch that this particular child is a good organizer, is a good leader, which you can't get from a book. True. This child has got fantastic PR, you know, and, and this is what is required today. In, 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 in fact, many employees are looking for these things, but you're not producing these things. They're only producing paper qualifications. An employee is looking for these kind of qualities. Then the employer also will be able to employ you, because right now you're only giving paper qualifications, but if you can produce this kind of human resource, you know, capabilities, the organizations, the institutions will want to employ these kind of, you don't, they don't want geniuses because they can't manage them anyway. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, if the child is excelling in mm -hmm. some area, well and good. And in the computer age that we have today, creativity cannot, cannot be, you know, just overnight developed. It has to be a culture that has mm -hmm. to be ingrained from small. Mm -hmm. And this is only through process of opportunity and the own method and your mm -hmm. inbuilt methodology to provide these opportunities. Mm -hmm. And creativity, that's why in many countries they, they don't have creativity because you don't give the opportunity. You, may, you have already taught the child to think in a very structured way. Exactly. And the child who thinks differently is punished. Can you imagine how if, if Siddhartha mm -hmm. had followed the same way, you know, of thinking, he would never have been uh, the Buddha. But he thought out of the box. He went, he investigated, he inquired, he found out all these things. You mean education should take uh, some constructivist approach? Yeah, a constructive and also opportunity, you know, mm -hmm. provide opportunities for creative thinking, lateral thinking, for children to talk, to express themselves. In fact, in America, you know, mm -hmm. in America and in England, many of the uh, schools have already adopted, uh, they have downplayed uh, classwork, daily work is given certain percentage, group work is given percentage. You know, if I know that uh, my grades will be down, if my whole group is down, then I'll work very closely with my group and my group marks will mm -hmm. also help me to have a higher mark. The process in developing this creates that harmony, yeah, that collectivity, mm -hmm. that connectivity, and all those other mm -hmm. things which, which cannot be taught. The other thing which we fail to understand is morals, ethics mm -hmm. cannot be taught. Mm -hmm. It has to be culture. And we teach morals, we teach ethics, we have exams for morals and ethics. That is not what the Buddha taught. You cannot teach these things. You have to practice, kriyatma, you have to seek kapada, you have to train, you have to keep on doing it until it becomes you. It becomes, becomes you, second nature to you. So all these things are absent, absolutely absent in the education system. I mean, I'm not saying Sri Lanka, but you know, universally this is a problem. But if we can introduce, and I think this will be a big gift by the <laughs> Buddhist world to the whole you know, uh, world, yes. uh, if we can introduce these concepts and these ideas, the Buddha, after all, as I, 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 I have, you know, great mm -hmm. confidence because he is a peerless, unparalleled, unsurpassed teacher. And definitely these are the methodologies he, he, he used and he was highly successful. There were no Buddhists during his time. He went, you know, to all 
towns, villages, teaching those who had different ideas, completely opposite ideas. He was able to change them because of the methods he used. Not just the teaching, but the methods as well. Wonderful methods, I suppose. Yes. And because I remember uh, for this uh, lady, Queen Kema, who yeah. was really proud of her beauty. Yes. A wonderful method Very was applied. Lady, lady yes. Lady. Carry on. Uh, yeah, a wonderful method was applied because the Buddha uh, made her see a picture of a lady and you know how the lady became old and uh, ultimately died and thereby uh, explaining or just uh, make her understand how that uh, the body would decay. So I think uh, that's what the Buddha uh, applied and I think sir now these days we are talking about constructivism, problem based learning, activity based learning, you know uh, we talk about them a lot and most of them are from the, the western writers and we, we sort of admire them okay this is the way but I suppose we have forgotten what the Buddha taught us. You're very right, you're very right. They are jargons modern jargons, you know, exactly. you have, not only that, you know, you have people like Stephen Covey, Zig Zagler, uh, Napoleon Hill, um, Anthony Robbins, you know, they come to Sri Lanka, they come to Malaysia, they come to Singapore, they have a big hall, you know, and you pay thousands and thousands of dollars just to go and listen to them. And what does uh, Napoleon Hill say? He says, if your mind um, visualizes or your mind thinks then you will become. The Buddha has taught this 2500 years ago. The mind is the forerunner of all your thoughts, speech and actions. Mano yes, Mano the first two verses of the Dhammapada is all on the mind. And that, that alone is enough for us to show that, you know, this is something which is, mm, uh, something which is, you know, very familiar to us and we have been having it for more than 2500 years ago. You're very right that these are all new jargons being used. The Buddha had, you mentioned Queen Kema, her vanity, he used what is called visualization techniques. And today modern trainers, modern teachers are using this, including in sports. If you watch a tennis game, for example, mm -hmm. or even a golf game, you, you'll find that uh, cricket, for example, you'll find them visualizing the stroke. Exactly. That's the visualization yeah. technique. You find them psyching themselves up, you know. Uh, you can see the body language, the body action, all these things the Buddha had already taught. He used the visualization technique. Um, and even in his own aspiration to attain Buddhahood, he used to recall the old man, the sick man, mm -hmm. and the corpse, the dead corpse. That psyched him. These are visualization techniques he used. I must get out of this. And the inspiration he, drew, he derived from the samana, the calmness, the serenity. I must achieve this. This is the way. That inspired him to leave. That is what that triggered him to want to leave and seek and to go forth. So he was very aware of these things and he used all of these things we can very comfortably in Sri Lanka and other traditional Buddhist countries very readily and comfortably bring it into fruition. Uh, we can introduce them in many ways. I, as I said, I've only done a little bit and uh, my mission actually is to encourage others. I'm not an educationist as I want to repeat over and over again. <laughs> if I can come up you know, with this kind of materials, I'm sure those who are very learned, very talented, very skillful educationists, they should be able to come up with similar books. And over a period of time, you know, we will be able to have a pool of books. Uh, from here, I went on to the other book, which is called My First Word Book. Here again, I endeavor to introduce the Buddhist pedagogy uh, of Pariyati, Patipati, and mm -hmm. Vatveda, and in English terms, cognitive affective learning. The child here is able now to read. Mm -hmm. It's beyond after the alphabet. And of, of course, this is my, my parents. Mm -hmm. um, I owe it to them. They were the Pubba Acharyas. And that is why I am able to speak to you in the way I'm speaking today. And I thought I'd also share some um, guidelines with parents. Here in this book, what I did was I introduced sentence structures. Mm -hmm that were completely different from what you get in the normal books which come from, you know, the West. 
here the, the sentences create the value systems we were talking about earlier in our discussion. Mm -hmm. You know, and why do they go to the altar? Again, a lot of discussion takes place, uh, interaction among the, 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 the students, and the teacher is facilitating. There are a lot of vocabulary that the child is able to develop through these lessons, which are holistic and which are able to bring about that value systems we are talking about. So here, you know, instead of just a with some other cognitive kind of you know, and I concept. also see that you have brought out Buddhist names like Amita, yes, Amila. Yes, and this yes. very what is happening is that you know we these words have become foreign to us because we don't use it. When I introduce these Buddhist names, that becomes vocabulary. When you say Ananda, then they know what is Ananda, mm -hmm. the meaning of Ananda. It, it becomes part of the vocabulary. In fact, I've written another book called uh, mm -hmm. Buddhist Names and Significance mm -hmm. of the Usage. And I also bring about the practice of naming the child. So here, again, action learning. Mm -hmm. And a lot of activities, you know, and the sentence structures and subject of the sentences mm -hmm. are emphasizing those value systems that should be inculcated in a child. Now, if he's talking and he's learning, he's practicing, he's doing in the class, he's doing at home, he is also in his relationship with his other peers, having this very clearly demonstrated, you will expect a generation of wonderful children. A generation. And that should be our goal. That should be our aim. Bring about a generation of children who would know how to live with each other, who will respect na nature, who would develop a liking, a fondness for plants and animals. That is our culture. We are in a position to contribute to the whole world because today they have this problem of climate change and environment degradation. Whereas from small, we are taught to respect and honor nature. That is what the Buddha did. That is what Prince Siddhartha did. So by taking him as an example, by practicing in the class, and doing all those exercises, there are a lot of exercises I bring in, action-oriented, less and less and cognitive. In fact, cognitive should take uh, 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 less and less time in terms of curriculum as the year goes on. In the be beginning stages, if you draw a graph, for example, x and y, maybe you will have to have more cognitive in the initial stages. But as you go on, the cognitive should be less, the affective and psychomotor should be more. Then the child benefits. The child is early learning more and internalizing everything. Then there's no worries, because the child becomes what you taught, not just knowing what you, what you taught. Well, sir, thank you so much because that is exactly what we and what the society expects from a truly educated person. And as we all know, it is always said, it is always great to light up at least one lamp without cursing the prevailing darkness. Now, that's what we have been up to. If you have learned something from today's program and the previous program, you have fulfilled our intention. So, while thanking uh, Dato Dr. Ananda Kumarasuri for inspiring us today and inspiring us on this topic so that you can learn something and I can learn something. And we're all inspired from his knowledge. Thank you so much, sir, on enlightening us with your knowledge. And may the Triple Gem bless you. And if you have any comments, please write to us on the Buddhist channel, Sri Sambo the Bihara, Kalambo 7. May the Triple Gem bless you. Sukhi Hotu. Sukhi Hotu.